Thank you very much, Terry. Is this too loud? Too short? Too, okay, so I'll talk, I'll talk lower. So this is my kids specking out property in Hawaii. And I said no, because it's really expensive there and very rough. This is uh, right near our place in Mexico, in Baja, Mexico. We have a large whale lagoon where there's over a thousand whales and they have baby whales all the time. So we always go there and uh, we love to interact with the whales, which they seem to do on their own without us being involved. So, so this is me, Terry's already done this. Uh, disclaimer and copyright. That one's not as interesting as the next one where I say some of the views expressed here are purely the insight and musing of the author, that'd be me, and should not be taken out of context or misconstrued to be the opinions of Collins Barrow, Brandon Gilbert, or any other lucid and intelligent person. <laughs> so what you're gonna get is sort of off the top comments and commentary on Trudeau mania and Trump dynasty, as well as a little bit of tax thrown in just to bore the hell out of you. So the agenda is we're gonna take a look at the March budget and tax rate changes, a brief update on T TFSA and RRSP planning, mortgages, pay down or not, how to help your children to finance the purchase of homes, a retirement checklist that should be useful for people, Trudeau Mania too, and what's in store for us all, housing trends, market strategies, and should we be worried, and Trump Dynasty, elected by the viewers of Tr <laughs> Duck Dynasty. That's why, when I thought that, I thought it's perfect. Duck Dynasty, Trump Dynasty, same people. So the current uh, status right now is the last budget in March was a, was a kind of good, bad budget for you. It gave you a harbinger of what's to come in the future. So finance did not increase the corporate tax rate on all professional corporations. Yay for everybody with a professional corporation. We did not get nailed with respect to that, except for some of us. They did not change income splitting for professionals that they threatened to do, Mr. Trudeau threatened to do, or dividends to children or to spouses. So all of that is left intact at this time, which is really good and very fortunate for us. They also had some legislation in there about attacking groups, and I've been told by the OAR, which is the Ontario Association of Radiologists, that they're going to back off on the group attack that they're doing, where they were going to increase the tax rate on partnerships and corporate groups that were operating. Doesn't affect many of you in here, I don't think. Uh, they did remove small income splitting tax arrangement. It really wasn't worth a heck of a lot of money anyway, and for most people that were incorporated, <laughs> Nobody used it. Pension splitting for seniors was not changed, which is another good, a good news thing. They did not change the inclusion rate on capital gains, and they did allow a decrease in tax rates. So for anybody that's under $200,000, you're actually gonna have a savings of about $679 next year. And the old age security they left that you can collect it at 65 instead of 67, which they had planned. It could have been a lot worse, and that's basically the way I look at it. So be happy and dance. This is my son and daughter-in-law, and we like to scuba dive, so uh, it's kind of fun sometimes. So other personal income tax implications. Tax-free savings account, as everybody's heard, is back down to $5,500 now from $10,000. So you had one year where you could put in $10,000. Canada Child Tax Benefit to replace the UCCB to start July 2016. Basically what they've done is they've created this maximum benefit of $6,400 per child under six and $5,400 per child over six and 17. This probably affects absolutely few people here, but my farm clients love this because farmers are really good at being worth $15 million and not paying any tax. We have some that are Mennonite clients that have eight kids do the math on this. It's amazing. They have no income, so they get $6,400 per child. Do the math. So what they're doing now more though is they're clawing stuff back. So essentially if your family income is above $187,000, you don't get any of those benefits anyway. So for most of my clients, they've taken away the UCCB, which is $160 a month, et cetera, and they've eliminated that, and they've added in this non-taxable benefit. So again, Mr. Trudeau is helping out you know, the, the lower income people and hitting us. 
So kids to us now are not worth as much anymore. You, sh you should still have them, but, you know, but still, they're just, not, they're just not worth as much. So these are the personal tax changes. The biggest thing is right on the bottom, where it says that basically the tax rates have gone up by 4%, 5.52%, and 5.17% on dividends. This slide is a little more useful. So this tells you where you are, where you're making money. So as you can see, these are all percentages. So I'm just going to wander over here and say, if you're 220 plus, your tax rate under dividend is 45.3%. On salary or other income is 53.53%. Thank God for incorporation, OK? Because otherwise, professionals would be paying those kind of rates. So, they, uh, so those rates have increased a lot. So now what we're trying to do is to split income with people to keep you in this rate. 150 to 200, or better yet, 140,000 to 150,000. These are marginal tax rates, which means the next dollar of income costs you that much money as you're going along. So basically, they've really bumped the rates up a lot. I happen to like this sort of 90 to 140,000 dollar rate if we can get down to that level. But if you have too much money or too much income or too many needs, it's fine to be up in a higher bracket. So basically, what they've done is Mr. Trudeau has shaken us down. This is not child abuse, OK? <laughs> this is my son on the right-hand side holding up my nephew. My son is six foot nine, so he's, he's fairly large. And, and my nephew actually loved that. It was very much fun for him, which was pretty funny. He was kind of laughing. So prepare for the shakedown. They're going to get all that money out of your pockets no matter what, and it's going to get worse. So tax rates have nowhere to go but up. It's whether or not they touch our beloved professional corporations or not. Oh, wrong one, sorry. There we go. So life insurance changes. One of the other things that they did in the budget is if you transferred a life insurance policy to a corporation and, and got the tax-free shareholder loan, they've now changed that rule so that when you die, you no longer get a tax-free dividend out for all of that money. For most people, you may not have done it. A few of our clients did it, and when they did it, I always said, this is too good to be true, because basically you would transfer a life insurance policy right into your corporation, and you'd be able to take out $120,000 tax-free. Didn't make any sense. And the government has now closed the loophole. Now, supposedly, the life insurance institutes, et cetera, are going after this, and they're saying that's retroactive tax planning, that's unfair. So it is something that they're going to try to reverse. Terry, I don't know if they're going to have a chance in hell of doing that or not. So for anybody else, these universal life insurance policies are also reduced in their effectiveness. So if anybody wants to buy one of these policies, you want to buy it by January 1st, 2017. And other than Terry Zavitz, every other agent in the world is out there selling these things like crazy. So, so because they're all saying, oh, it's gone as of this date, et cetera. Well, the rules then change dramatically, but only when you die do you see that difference. So it's still worthwhile to have life insurance inside of your professional corporation because you're paying the premiums out of lower after-tax dollars. But this deal where we were able to transfer an old policy that people had and take out a lot of money is reduced in its ability. And basically, you can't do it anymore as of the budget date. Um, so it's still OK, because it's better to have the, the money now than later. So if I can get $100,000 tax-free today and pay the tax when I die, what do I care? It's not a big deal. So change in students' uh, benefits. So the education amount and the tuition amount will be eliminated in 2017. This will reduce the tax credits available for transfer and for students to use up against dividends. Only tuition paid is now deductible. For those attending over eight months, this is a loss of credits of about a value of about $930 per year. It's a fairly big deal because we use these tuition credits to offset dividends when they're received by your child. So again, this is something that Trudeau targeted because he didn't like how we were able to pay dividends of fifty to sixty thousand dollars to a child and have the child not pay any tax or pay twelve hundred dollars of tax. 
So Trudeau's kind of taken back a little bit with that and saying, now it's going to cost you not $1,200, it's going to cost you $2,100. It's still a heck of a deal, though. They also got rid of the child fitness and arts amounts for 2017. These were the biggest pain in the butt for us because everybody brought in their receipts, and if ever we got an audit, you'd get reassessed, you'd have to send it back. The credit was only worth $375. It was a stupid credit, but sounded good to the conservatives when they brought it in. So the other changes are that grants to low-income families increased to $3,000 per year, $1,200 per year for middle-income families. Students will be required to contribute a flat amount each year, and financial assets of the student will not matter. Loan repayment thresholds will change, so no student will have to repay Canada student loans until they earn $25,000 per year. Again, what you're seeing is in Canada, more stuff is going to be based on income-based support. So if your income's too high, your kids won't see any of that money. So that's essentially what's going to happen to everybody. So when you have students, so basically what happens is parents pay more. We're smiling there. I should have painted little unsmiley faces on us at that time, but especially my wife, she's on the right. That's the patient Jane, and those are good friends of ours. So the bottom line is more of the benefits are being phased out for the higher income families. Corporations for health professionals and other small business still make a lot of sense. The deferral is even greater with higher personal tax rates. So before the top tax rate was used to be 46%, then it went up to 49%, then it went up to 53.53%. So that 15.5% corporate tax rate, that deferral keeps increasing up and up all the time. So it is a better way to do it. Manage your personal incomes to maximize the benefits of income splitting with your spouse and family members to keep your personal income below 200 or better yet 150,000. I did it again, pressed the wrong one. So TFSA, this is just a bit of a revisit from the end game speech that I did. If you're incorporated, don't take money out of your corporation. Pay tax at 45% to put it into a TFSA. Hold off until later on, or if you have children that are going to university, when there's a little bit of excess cash there. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not a valid purpose to do it. Leave it in the corporation to make money. Use the TFSA as a temporary savings account. Use it for, uh, for buying a house after the individual has saved up their $25,000 for their RSP for the down payment. Some of this stuff will be stuff you want to pass on to your kids. So be careful not to recontribute the same year that you take money out of a TFSA. It is a dog's breakfast to fix that. So always just be careful with your TFSA. RRSP, we're one of the firms that still believes in an RRSP and not putting all your eggs in one corporate basket. Fixed income security should be largely weighted more in the RRSP and not on the corporate investment account. Use spousal plans now because Trudeau threatened to get rid of the seniors splitting. And as more of us get older and split more of our income, and if he gets poorer in Canada and builds up the deficit, they may end up changing that again. So it never used to matter because you could always split your RRSP and your RIF income. But that, I don't think it's going to come to an end because he didn't attack it now, but it might be something that they take a look at later. So again, put those into spousal plans instead. Ensure to include all the assets when you do your, your mix and allocation with advisors. So what happens is some people have a UWO pension, for example. They have an RRSP and they have outside of RRSP investments in their corporation, and they have outside of RRSP and corporate investments personally. Look at, make sure your advisor looks at the whole kit and caboodle at the same time so that they can properly manage your assets. I don't care if you're still with the Sun Life Pension Board when you retire, for example, from UWO. Anything like that is okay, because Sun Life's got really low management fee rates, so they, they compete better than MD management does. So it is something just to take a look at. Again, remember everything. So in your Canadian corporation, remember Canadian dividend paying shares. Basically, the dividends are tax-free as long as you're paying out dividends. Interest bearing in RRSPs, foreign in RRSP, unless, a unless it's a direct investment. If you want to own Apple shares, like some people do, don't, don't put it into your RRSP, put it into your corporation. You can buy other alternative foreign investments that are not subject to the potential of US estate tax, which is a pain. Corporations don't die, so they don't have to worry about US estate tax. 
it's okay to have U.S. in the corporate accounts even though the tax cost on foreign tax credit. So basically, jump off a cliff, invest, be active with everything that you're doing with respect to that. Look at all your investments <clears throat> constantly because nowadays when it's only 3 and 4% and 5 and 6% return once in a while, it makes a big difference to get that extra 1%. Our take on mortgages. So now we've changed my outlook. I don't know if Brandon had the same outlook as I did, my colleague Brandon Gilbert over there. Um, now what I try to do with people is I try to pay down the mortgage to a comfort zone. So for example, 30% of value on a million dollar home as a guideline or one year of income. Pay down to the point where you can easily pay off the mortgage by say five years prior to your retirement. With interest rates at 2.59%, now I'm starting to say, wait a minute, if I have to pay 40 to 45% to take the money out of the corporation to pay down on my mortgage, is it such a good deal anymore? So it used to be something I used to hammer down on the mortgages, hammer down, get rid of them, and then start to invest. Now I'm doing it this way, where I'm hammering down the mortgage to a comfort zone, and then after that, starting to invest. So again, that's all based on reducing your income to keep your tax rates down, save more money in the corporation to obtain the deferral. Never pay CMHC fees. Tell your kids, tell everybody. Use the $200,000 left over after school if you're a new grad. Uh, you may have to be a little tricky on that. I can tell people how to do it if it, if it need be. Try to help your kids avoid CMHC fees. I tried to explain this to my kids that you would think would know better. And they said, well, I'm not gonna worry about it. I said, wait. You're going to pay, in their case, it was CMHC fees on a $500,000 house with 10% down was $11,000. 5% down is $17,000. But they amortize that over the length of the mortgage. So by the time you're done, you've paid $24,000 of after-tax dollars for this fee that most people with parents that are generous can get around. So I always try to focus on that for everybody. So if over 500,000, they've recently changed, it made it really hard to buy houses, over 500, you have to have like 10% down on the excess over 500. So 5% down the first 500. So our take on mortgages, extra variable. I like fixed as no surprises and rates are lower than ever for five years. However, some with fixed term variable may win, but they lose some flexibility. Everybody here should have a home line plan on their house, their cottage, on whatever property you own. It does not cost you anything to have the ability to borrow against your house up to 80%. You can use the money to buy a cottage, you can use the money to buy the kids a house. If a child loan, though, make sure you document it with a promissory note that I'll get into in just a couple of minutes. So this is back, way back when in about Terry, when was the first time I did my 2009? Oh, yeah, about that. You know, about 2009, as I told everybody, I said, go buy in the U.S. Buy U.S. dollars, buy U.S. investments, buy U.S. property. This place has now gone from 900,000 to 1.5. But remember, the 900, our dollar was at par. The 1.5, our dollar is at 1.27. So big difference, big difference overall down there. So help your kids, but be careful. Matrimonial homes are included in marital property, regardless of which spouse or parent fund the purchase. If you gift money to your child to buy a house, one half automatically goes to the spouse on divorce. If you gift money to your child and that child invests the money, for example, in the market, the, and if those funds are segregated and kept in that child's name, those funds stay in that child's name upon divorce. So I always recommend that people document any assistance in buying a house with a promissory note to be acknowledged by the spouse. This will happen because our kids cannot afford that 20% down payment when houses are now 500,000 to 2.2 million dollars. So the promissory note is then included in you and your spouse's assets upon death and at that time can be repaid by the child and offset the other bequests in the estate. So it's something that I put in place for just about everybody. The terms of the loan are it's non-interest bearing, so you don't have to pay tax on the interest. However, if demanded to be paid, the note becomes interest bearing at market rates. And the reason I did this is I've seen a couple divorces, not my own, thank goodness, um, 
but I've seen a couple divorces that drag out for a long time, and the parents kind of sitting there saying, well, they owe me $200,000 on the house. The wife is getting, or the spouse is getting a free ride, essentially, on that $200,000. So this just makes it more potential. You don't have to exercise it, but it gives you the benefit to do that. If the property is in joint name with the child and their spouse, both should sign. If just in your child's name, the spouse should acknowledge receipt of it. So it's something that's very tricky to do, but we're all doing this kind of stuff all the time now. So it's something very important to deal with. There's no need to register the loan as a mortgage against the property. When the child obtains a mortgage from a bank, you may have to indicate that the loan is a gift for banking purposes. So you can't publish this to the banks or anybody, okay? So that's not gonna be allowed. But, but essentially what I do is there's a document that the bank says, you have to sign a document that says that you've gifted that money to your child. So you sign the document that says that you've gifted it to the child because the bank requires that because they don't want you to be demanding that money to be paid back at any time. Then after closing, I get the kids to sign a promissory note. Does it stand in court? I don't know, but it's better than nothing. So I still do it at that particular time and I argue and I say, it's not my fault the bank is stupid. You know, they know that I'm giving them the money, but I really want to keep it for marital purposes. So again, the banking laws versus the matrimonial laws are fighting again. So if a large loan, the spouse should have independent legal advice to ensure that the spouse understands what's being signed. And there's the happy couple. That's my, my six foot nine son and his wife to be soon for next May. Our take on retirement. So depending on income of the individual, your goal should be a million in your RRSP, a million in the corporation, non-registered investments of at least 300,000. TFSA can be included in the 300,000. Use non-registered funds for buying cars, repairs to house and other surprises. If you got more than that, you win. If you have less than that, it could be a little bit tough going. So, uh, so this is now the checklist. So when you're approaching retirement, this is the one that you go to to say, okay, what do I do now? Because this just kind of explains it to you. So make arrangements for your RRSP and investments to be a low fee rate on investments. With returns of three to 6%, and I've said this in all the end game speeches that I do, a 2% fee erodes investment returns. They all invest in the same stuff. So there's nobody that's any smarter than anybody else out there. They may say they are, but they're not. So always do that. Do not apply for CPP until you reach age 65 if you continue to work and earn employment income. So that's a change. In the earlier speeches I used to give, I used to say, apply at age 60, get it early. The reason I said that was because you didn't have to pay the premiums anymore. And the premiums, if you're self-employed or if you're in a corporation, are 47 or like $5,000 a year of premiums that you're paying for CPP. So as soon as you turn 65, you fill out this form, the CPT30 form, and then your employer or your own professional corporation no longer has to collect CPP because it's a ripoff. So then start to collect it at age 65. Trying to collect it before then really doesn't make a lot of sense to me, so I'm now changed my tune to collecting it at, at 65. Unless you're retired, if you're retired and not working or earning any employment income, go ahead and collect it at age 60, that's fine. Two years before retirement, do a cash flow to determine what your post-retirement spending needs are to ensure that you have enough income to retire. If not enough income, then rearrange or plan to change your lifestyle, including a review of housing needs. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down, mostly with Toronto clients, where they sit there and say, well, I need 20 grand a month. I'm going, well, to have 20 grand a month, you need like $4 million in your RSP. Oh, well, I only have one. I said, you lose, you know, like it's not gonna work, you know, so, so there you go. So if there's not enough income, again, rearrange things like your housing needs. Do not apply for old age security if your personal income is above 85,000 after age 65. There's this thing called the clawback. They pay you $6,500. If you earn $100,000 a year, they take back the $6,500. So there's no prize in applying for old age security anymore. They changed this a couple years ago. So basically I'm saying if you're even 85,000, they're gonna claw back half of it. So wait, because there's a new provision that allows you to defer your old age security until age 70 and increase your benefits. 
So during that period between 60 and 70 years of age, you can get up into that higher tax bracket that I've talked about, like 100,000, 120,000. Draw down some of your income as you're going along so that hopefully when you reach age 70, or not hopefully, it'd be nice to not have, you know, to have more money than that, not to worry about it. But hopefully by age 70, one of you will be able to collect the old age security and keep it. So that's kind of the plan right now. And it actually pays quite well. So this is where you could live if you don't have enough money to retire. And as I've told many people, this, this picture has been around for a long time. That's my house in Mexico when we bought it. 3,500 bucks. Such a deal. With outhouse as well. So the maximum, uh, the maximum deferral for the OAS is 60 months. Basically, it's 0.6 per month. So you have an increase of 36% of that old age security that takes it from like $550 a month to $727 a month. So it works out pretty well to sort of defer that. And again, your spouse could consider applying for old age security if you can't, if, if one of your incomes is lower and the other is higher. Do apply for CPP when you're 65, as I said. RIF at least part of your RRSP to withdraw the minimum of the RIF to be able to income split with your spouse. And also, once you RIF after age 65, there's a $2,000 deduction that you get for the first $2,000 of your RIF. So your investment advisors will all tell you, make sure that a family takes out $4,000 a year of RRSP because the first $2,000 is reduced tax rate. It's not tax free, but it's a reduced tax rate. So review your expenses to cut back on unneeded expenses, such as disability insurance. Many disability policies, and Terry, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, cease coverage at age 65. So it's not normally a good value proposition to continue to pay the premiums if healthy. If you are 64 and disabled, the company may only pay you for one year anyway. Some, some policies go beyond that, right, Terry? Some go to 70 and things like that. That's fine, but just take a look at that because the purpose of disability insurance is to protect you. Well, if you're 64 years of age and if you're healthy, why are you throwing that money down the drain at that time? Do you continue to need all that life insurance? When buying insurance, consider your needs and try to have insurance come up for renewal when you turn 65. So Terry and I talk about this all the time where I'm a big fan of a 20-year term policy. So I have some clients that are 38 years of age getting a 20-year term policy and I'm saying, ooh, wait a minute, that policy is going to run out when you're 58. Maybe you'd like to have coverage till you're 65. So sometimes I'll say, get a 20-year policy at, at that time, but when you turn 45, apply for another 20-year policy and see if you can get one that'll carry you through to age 65. So again, just to sort of manage it from that standpoint. I don't have to tell people how to do that. I was just going to say, I'd like a solution. You can go 10-year term at 38. And then any time in the first seven years, you can move to a 20-year term. Yep. So I'll push you up 45 and move to a 20-year term. No evidence of health required, and then you go to 65. That's why I don't deal with life insurance, because Terry, because Terry gets it all the time. You know, now I have more new clients that all say, what about this? What about this life insurance? What about all this? I says, I don't know anything about that anymore, because Terry deals with it always for me, so I don't have to worry. So that's good. Uh, again, take a look at it. If you're self-employed, Writing off a car, consider buying or leasing a new car 36 months prior to retirement. All my clients love that when I tell them that. And I just had to convince my wife the same thing where I said, well, I'm getting closer to retirement, so I should get a new car too. She didn't like that idea much, but she saw the speech beforehand. <laughs> this way, you go into retirement with a relatively new car, then at least you can write off the bulk of the car and pay for it while you're working. So everybody drives me crazy when they come in and they say, I'm 65, I've just retired. I'm now gonna go buy a new car. I say, well, I can't write off any of that once you're retired. I can write it off beforehand if you buy it in the year before or the year before, but I can't do anything. Consider continuing to work part-time after retirement to augment your income if the work is comfortable and pays well. Earning $60,000 per year, not as a Walmart greeter, okay, but as a professional, after retirement is like having an additional million dollars in the bank, so it's a good deal. At minimum, it continues to allow you to write off some of those expenses, like your cars and fees and, and going to conferences and things like that. Do not cancel or remove your home line of credit on your house. I've had clients that have done that, and they said, I just retired, I paid off my mortgage, I'm all done, and then I've said, well, you want to help your kids, right? Yeah. I said, well, 
How are you going to do that? Well, I'll put a mortgage on my house. Well, all of a sudden the bank says, you're retired. Your income no longer is $250,000. It's now $80,000, so you don't qualify for as big a mortgage as you did before. But if you put it in place the year that you retire, before you retire, the bank will give you 80% of your house up to $800,000 as a line of credit or as a regular mortgage. No fee, no charges, happier than hell to do that for you. So I tell everybody when you go into retirement, you want to have all these mortgages. I don't want you to owe anything on the mortgage, but I want them to be there and be available for you. Because if you do want to maintain two properties, like a cottage and a home in the city, and if you can't afford it, you can use it like a reverse mortgage and use that money, borrow that money to keep the properties going as you're going along. But after retirement, the banks limit what you can pay. You then will have this mortgage to draw against should you wish as a reverse mortgage. You, you can use this credit to help you stay in home, home longer, etc. Don't get divorced. <laughs> okay? The hardest thing I deal with in my practice is one, helping people with marriage contracts, and two, divorces. Okay? It's a pain in the butt. It decimates you completely decimates your value completely, totally screws up your financial plan and your retirement plan. Remember in your early years, you're more active and it's more costly to live. Then it gets lower cost for a while, then it gets higher cost for a while when you have to go into a home. So in the early years, you tend to burn through a little bit more money. Some people get concerned and I'm saying, you're not gonna be active maybe that long, so go ahead, have some fun in the first five years of retirement, do your traveling, do the rest of that stuff, because eventually you're going to be really happy sitting in front of the TV watching TV, and, and, and you're not going to spend any money. So I'm told. So retirement checklist. Make sure your retirement home is right-sized and properly oriented for old age. I love this. I'm a big fan of like single-family properties, and I look at some people and they've got a place in Old South where the master bedroom is on the fourth floor and the staircase goes up like this. And I'm just going, you know, you can't get one of those chair lifts in that little narrow spot. So it's not the right house at that time. So, so essentially, everything that we do when we put a big renovation on our cottage, everybody said, why you got these big doors? I said, because someday I'm going to be rolling through them. So <laughs> there you go. That's, that's the way to do it. Same thing with the kitchens and everything else. Make sure they're all the right size. Only do it once, not twice. I can't tell you how many people do one renovation and then 10 years later said, oh, my needs have changed. Now I need to do this, I need to do that. Update your wills, powers of attorney for financial affairs and for health care. Make sure your executors and powers of attorney are right aged. So I can't tell you how many times I've sat there and I've said to somebody, I'm really happy that your older brother is your executor, but he's like 10 years older than you are and you're 65, I'm going, let the kids be the executors. They will figure it out. There's lots of professional help out there. Do not generally, and there's nobody from any management here, I doubt, do not appoint a corporate trustee as your trustee for running your estate. Your kids can hire them as an agent, and then your kids are the boss. Okay? If you appoint MD management, MD management's contract, and any other trust company, TD Canada Trust or anybody else, always says, in the event of a tie, we win. So if there's three executors, two of your kids and one your trust company, the, the trust company always wins the battle. So don't do it. Agent is fine, because they'll still advise them properly, they'll still do it. Normally, you don't even need that. You can manage it on your own with a little bit of help. So again, kids are still the best. I'm still a strong believer in that. If the kids are really not able to do it, then look to another friend or somebody else if that's possible. Last resort is normally a corporate trustee in my mind. Then you drop anchor and party. <laughs> this, is a place, this is a place called the Sandbar. It's in Isla Mirada, and it's from zero feet deep to three feet deep. So normally there's 300 boats out there on a quiet day, including mine, because that's my boat and that's my wife's <coughs> foot there, I think, at that time. This also shows you the wealth in the United States, okay? See this little thing here that goes out behind this little boat? That's an anchor, so the guy doesn't have to put an anchor out. It's, an, it's a hydraulic thing that goes up like this, up like that, and digs into the sand. 6,000 bucks for that thing. 
and all these boats have got it out here. I've got a regular anchor, thank you, cost me a hundred bucks. That's, that's the wealth that's in the US. When you sit there and you see, and I don't have any pictures here, you see the boats with the four engines on them. Each engine is worth fifty to sixty thousand dollars. So these things are crazy. Americans have no end of spending ability or money or anything. Okay, now to Mr. Trudeau. Wants to make middle class strong again, so he uses income-based programs. Robin Hoodie may be more appropriate because he does wear a hoodie from time to time. <laughs> Tax the rich, reduce the benefits to the perceived 1%, and increase the benefits for the middle class. Spend your way to happiness in Canada. Larger public programs, larger deficits. Has changed his way a little bit since he came into power, so he's backed off some on many of the things, including the attack on professional corporations, etc. And the realities of, 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 of politics is now being more expected. Uh, the immigration, if, if controlled, is a good thing for growth in Canada. We'll get into that a little bit later. And I love it, you know, Robin Hoodie. That's him, right? Like, like cute guy, you know, really a cute guy, but otherwise. So we should have concerns about overreaching. So climate control and the impact on the Canadian economy on the oil sands is very large. Canada is now still a good place to do business, an okay place to do business. I should actually change that. But plan for the dollar to be lower than it is now unless structural issues in the US, like Trump dynasty. A low dollar is good for employment. You know, the US last month generated 38,000 new jobs in the United States. Canada generated 14,000. It's supposed to be the other way around, right? So if Canada does 14, the US should do 140,000 jobs. But every, everybody went nuts when they heard that. They all said, oh my God, the US is stalled. I said, yeah, but look at their unemployment rate is 4.3% compared to 6.9%. If they keep generating 150,000 jobs, their unemployment rate will be zero. 4.3% is already considered full employment in the United States. So the United States isn't doing so bad, even though that job report came out the way that it did. So a lower dollar needs to be consistent to encourage business to operate in Canada. What's happened to us in Canada in the last year and a half with oil prices and the dollar effectively has really messed up our economy. Watch the dollar. Watch for the black swan events. The Brexit could be huge, could be huge. Trump dynasty. China, world events are all there. You know, my opinion is if the dollar gets to above 80 to 85 cents, buy the dollar, buy the US dollar at that time. So if that happens, and I'm not sure when that's gonna happen, it could happen if the US increases interest rates, which, you know, which could happen fairly easily. <coughs> We're already at 78 cents. My bet before was I said the dollar will trade between 69 and 72 cents. I've already been proven wrong because it's 78 cents consistently. Imagine your US company operating in Canada or a Canadian company in the US in the past year with a decrease in costs in Canada of over 13%. So imagine your wage costs, all of a sudden you're operating your plant, GM's operating its plant here or, or wherever. Your wage costs went down by 13% last year when the dollar went down so low. That's crazy. And then from January to December, the exchange rate went from 82 cents to 73 cents. So again, 12 or 13 percent. How can you do business and why do people want to do business in Canada when our exchange rate is like a yo-yo? We need not an 80 cent dollar, we need a 75 cent dollar to really make manufacturing cook and be worth it. And climate change is, an and this was actually taken because I was in Paris when the climate change conference happened, and that's what they put across was kiss to ground on the Eiffel Tower. It, it was also right after the Paris attacks, too. I, I had this wonderful ability to be in the wrong place at the wrong time sometimes. But, but that's going to be a big event because if that kills our oil sands and, and stops us completely from doing a lot of stuff, it's going to be another problem for Canada. So a problem for Canada is, means the US dollar is going to increase and our dollar is going to stay flatter. 
So the housing market. You all probably have houses, I bet, right? So this is from personal experience because um, we own property in Florida. We rent out all these properties, by the way, so we don't really just go there all the time. So we rent our property in Florida. We rent our cottage out all summer long. And, and recently our kids have moved out west, so we have bought a property out west as well to get in the market. So here's the take on the housing market across Canada and the U.S., because I'm fairly well tuned into all of it. In, is China driving the markets? Yes and no. They say they're buying 5%. I think it might be closer to maybe under 10%, but it's still not as big as you think it is. We know that for the first time ever in 2014 and 15, China outplaced Canada as the top country in the world buying U.S. property. So with all our snowboards and snowbirds and everything, last year, Canada, uh, China bought 16% compared to 12% of international buyers buying property ending March 31st, 2015. We don't have up-to-date numbers. 14%. Compared to March 2014 stats where Canada was 23%, which dropped down to 14%. Now that's because of our dollar, obviously. We're not buying anything anymore because it's too darn expensive. The Chinese, though, have, 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 have come back and are buying everything. If you think we have uncertainty, this is what the Chinese elite have. The devaluation of the, of the yuan and having potential currency controls and other legislation imposed on them, i.e., you can't take your money out of this country. We're not going to let you take it out. Could happen tomorrow. They're worried about their markets, both real estate and international markets. If you ever talk to anybody that's been to China, there are all these cities that have got huge condos in them, and they're all empty because, because there's nobody to live in them, and there's nobody that can afford them. So they've overbuilt their condo market completely. They had a huge crash in their market. In the Chinese market, in some of the Hong Kong markets as well, um, if, if you're Canadian, you can't buy any shares. You, you have to be a Chinese person to be able to buy shares in that Hong Kong market. So their market is restricted. The, the rest of the world can't buy shares in it, in their one market. And that's really their biggest market. And that's the one that took the hit last year of 35% downtrodden as they're going along. So you can see that they want to get their money out to a safe haven, i.e. foreign real estate. That's basically what they're saying. Uh, now the OECD thinks that the Canadian market is out of control. There was a, uh, I was listening to uh, Benjamin Tall speak and he was just at an, at an OECD meeting of the world economy. All of the economists from all over the world were there. They spent three hours of a one day meeting just talking about Canadian real estate. And Benjamin said very well, and I agree with him completely, they don't get it. They don't under understand that our Canadian banks are still strong. There's no ninja borrowing. Does everybody know what ninja is? No income, no job. That's what happened in 2008 all over the US, right? They could buy any house they wanted, a million dollar house, they could do it. So the leveraging isn't anywhere near where it was in 2008. Many of the foreign buyers in Canada don't have a mortgage. Most of them probably don't have a mortgage. So I'm sitting there going, well, yeah, they may sell their property, but the bank's not going to sell their property because they own it personally and it's already paid for. Due to immigration in attractive large cities, there's still a demand for housing. Toronto and Vancouver are not Miami. Few people know this. Miami is 500,000 people. Toronto's 2.8 million. We were in Miami last year for a step meeting, the global conference in Miami in June. A ton of towers in downtown Miami, not in South Beach, but in downtown Miami, and they're building more towers. We'd go for a walk at night, there'd be two lights on in a condo that, that had 80 units in it. And at night, there's nobody on the streets. Go to Toronto and tell me it's the same. It's not the same. Like Toronto and Vancouver are hopping, there's zillions of people there, it is not the same as the US. The rest of the world doesn't get that. They just look at the U.S. and they say, oh, it's just like the U.S. because they're, you know, their market's overblown. That is not the case at all. So a Vancouver small house <laughs> is $950,000 for this. And, and I don't think he pays high property taxes on it as well, but, but probably does. Canada has a higher immigration rate per capita. So one of the things that I look at compared the U.S. to Canada is the immigration rate is eight to nine percent per capita in Canada. 
we're bringing people in all the time. Many different of uh, the ethnicities, everybody comes in, they have to show that they have money to come in most of the time, they have to be professionals. You know, I can't tell you how many professionals that, you know, that I've seen in the last five years that are from other countries. And they're great individuals, there's no problem with it. The US rate is three to 4% per capita. And that's before the Donald gets in. Okay, when the Donald gets in, he's gonna maybe shut that door like a steel door trap and bring it down. Growth happens with immigration because in, 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 when you're coming to Canada, you go to a large city. You don't go to Exeter, okay? You go to Toronto, you go to Vancouver. So that's why these markets are being driven as well as they are. Comparisons of our cities should be appropriate to U.S. And they don't get this. Like Toronto is like New York City. Vancouver is like San Francisco. So don't be comparing Chicago to Toronto. They're not the same. Toronto is more like New York than it is Chicago. The low Canadian dollar is drawing the Chinese in because they're saying, wow, I can get way more for my buck. Even though we think the prices are crazy, compare buying a house in San Francisco to, a house, to buying a house in Vancouver. It's, it's just huge. Condo prices, for example, condo prices in London, Ontario, $184 per square foot. 424 to 660 in Florida waterfront. South Surrey, BC, that I'm familiar with, 300 per square foot. Waterfront might be 580. Toronto is 600 to 900. Vancouver is about $900 per square foot. So remember, a thousand square foot condo, $900,000. That's a lot of money. New York is 2250 per square foot. So that thousand square foot condo is $2.2 million. US. You know, it's so, so $28.50 per square foot. So it's crazy. San Francisco, a little more reasonable, $12.50. Condo prices are somewhat soft compared to single family housing. So you've seen that. There's lots of condos for sale everywhere. They're building a whole brand new one right up behind our office. Two brand new big condos that they're gonna sell and everything else to everybody. As long as they're building condos, condos are not gonna go up in value. So this is White Rock, British Columbia, and that happens to be our condo there that we bought. Right by the White Rock, as you can see. So, so if ever you're there to visit, you can see where that is. So the trend in housing. The shortage of downtown inside the envelope, single family housing in Vancouver and Toronto is what's driving prices higher and higher. Their options are to live in one of the condos with lower costs and lower overall growth and value due to larger number of buildings or to commute through messy traffic. So I've done the commute to Toronto for years. I'm now doing the commute into Vancouver more often. It's a shit show, excuse my French. It is just, it is just unbelievable and just does not work. So guess what? All my clients in Toronto, they all want to live within two miles of the hospital. And they're all buying properties for $2.2 million and everything else because the option is unacceptable to them. So those who can afford mortgages will buy inside the envelope, and that's what I call it, inside the envelope of the 401, Gardner, you know, Don Valley, et cetera. Inside that square, they're not building any more land. They're just not doing it. Houses are affordable in part due to the transfer of wealth from the baby boomers to their kids. So a lot of people, my clients are obviously are physicians that have high incomes, so they're spending the money. The people that don't have such high incomes, their parents are sitting on one of these places in Toronto, right? That's gone from $150,000 when they bought it to $1.6 million. Guess who's gonna help out when the kid wants to buy a house? It's pretty easy to figure that out. So that trend I think is gonna stay and it's something that we're gonna see more and more. Right now, there's a feeding frenzy in the market. The young and the old who want to be in certain areas are buying now for fear of the market going higher and pricing them out. That's exactly what my wife and I did. We were out, out west in BC visiting our kids. We saw the writing on their wall. Our youngest son was gonna get married. Grandkids were gonna be out there. And we said, okay, let's buy now. So we said, we're gonna buy now. We happen to be stupid and buy a really nice place with a waterfront view, but since we bought, that property's gone up $100,000. Like it's crazy. And, and you don't know what it's gonna be like later on when you buy. And anybody in the Vancouver market or the island or, any play or anybody else can see that. So what's happening in the Vancouver area, South Surrey, et cetera, and the lower mainland is so short 
that there's multiple offers on reasonably priced places. My son bought a place. We, we said, yes, we agree. It's a good time to buy. Buy now. Five offers. The place was on the market one day. Five offers. It was crazy. So no more land left. In that area, if you, if, if, uh, you know that area at all, there's this big ocean that you can't build anymore. There's these big high mountains you can't build anymore. There's the U.S. on the south. So it's really landlocked completely, and they don't allow them to convert farmland for housing. Not that there is a lot of farmland there, but basically it's very restricted. So same thing with London, Ontario. You know, we keep busting at the seams, right? Like Arva is like part of London and all the rest of that. But in the downtown core, anybody that lives in the north end of the city knows how tough it is to get downtown or across the city during rush hour. Like if you have to commute from Sunningdale to LHSC, I don't know how long that takes if it's like 8 o'clock in the morning. It takes a long time. So all that stuff is there. And what we're seeing is the Venturi effect, which is causing prices to increase on Vancouver Island and closer cities to Toronto. So it's this effect that if you can't afford here, you buy as close as you can, and it just keeps moving outwards a little bit. So Kitchener-Waterloo is now more expensive. You know, London is more expensive. The same trend is working in southern Ontario, more to what your point is of where you are. Even London is being impacted by higher Toronto prices. We sold our condo here. We had five people looking at it from Toronto. And they, and they were all thinking, what a deal. This is unbelievable compared to what I'd pay for in Toronto for a luxury large condo. So look for the trend for, uh, for higher housing costs closer to downtown in London, as well as traffic gets worse and worse. Too many condos is a feature of Toronto, Vancouver, and I'd like to hold London as well. So as they're building all these condos, again, they can keep building till the cows come home. Just like Florida, where I tell everybody, don't buy property in Florida on a golf course. Why? Have you ever driven across Florida? There's like a thousand miles of like nothing that they could build golf courses on. Same thing here. They can build a lot of condos in downtown London and downtown Toronto, and they already are doing that. So these are not good value propositions as more are built for short-term holds. So the other thing I say a little bit later is if you know where you want to live and if you're buying a condo and if it's in Toronto or someplace like that and if you want to live there, that's fine to buy that one. Don't buy anything that you're going to hold less than five years though. So if you have a house in downtown London, keep it for a while. Do not buy a condo yet as the house will appreciate faster than the condo in the next little while. Don't buy student housing. How many times have everybody asked me and said, I want to buy a house for my kids to live in Toronto or London or anywhere else. They say, great, you're in competition with the University of Toronto and the University of Western Ontario for housing. You will lose, and people do all the time. Only buy real estate when you know you're going to hold it for 10 years. Otherwise, don't buy it. Short term does not work. Consider buying, consider buying your retirement home or condo where you want to retire to before you actually retire. Rent it out, do whatever you want. So if you want to follow your kids, like we have a tendency to do, and if that's the case, don't be afraid to buy in their market. If you can rent out the place, which you can't in many places in British Columbia, rent out the place and get some income going. Do it while you've got income coming in. Then you can sell your house here and move to your final destination. Well, it may not be your final destination, sorry. So if you want or need to save money in uh, retirement, move out of the city. So for a lot of people, not so much for the people in your income tax bracket as they are, but I'm sitting there and I'm saying, like, move to Sarnia. You know, move to Lucan, move to Exeter, move to places like that, because you'll have change left over when you sell your house in London. And it's pretty nice. It's still pretty darn close. You can still get into town, probably quicker than you can if you live on the other side of London, so it's, so it's better that way. But always look at that. You get better bang for your buck and you keep the change. Beware of selling the big house and spending just as much money on an upscale condo or townhouse. I get this a lot where people say, well, I'm going to sell my older house in town. I'm going to buy something and I'll have money left over. Well, you end up blowing your brains out on the condo. Those condos and those big towers, the upper ones are like $1.2 million for a condo, you know, which I don't think is supportable so much, but people are buying them every day and they're happy with that. Cottages and recreational property, try to buy a waterfront close to hospitals and bigger centers that you see yourself being able to live when you get older. So I've got a lot of clients up in Toronto. They all talk about Muskoka, Muskoka, Muskoka. They want to retire there. And then I say, and you're going to have a helicopter to get airlifted to Toronto when you get sick? 
So I love like Bayfield, Grand Band areas like that because you're only an hour away from a major center. London is a deal for everybody. We should all embrace it as much as we can. Now is not the time to buy in the US due to the dollar and the run up in prices unless you can find a deal and if the dollar strengthens a little bit. Otherwise, rent, it's much better. Condo fees are crazy expensive, so beware. So many people with houses get into a condo. New condos, they lie. They lie. <laughs> they, you know, they tell you, oh, it'll be $200 a month. And six months after you're in there, it's $400 a month. Like, it always goes up crazy. The more services, the more money it costs you. I'm not a fan of renting, although I just rented my first apartment downtown London because we sold our condo. So I'm not a fan, unless it's for under five years, because a lot of people don't understand. They want to sell their house, and then they want to rent. And I'm saying, you know, if you sell your house, even if you get a million dollars, after tax to pay $2,500 a month, you need a million dollars. So you better sell your house for a million dollars and invest it, because you pay tax on that money that you're paying that rent from. And that doesn't make any sense to me as an accountant or as an economist, as I say, I'd rather spend $300,000 on a condo, not $1.2 million, but $300,000 on a condo, and then not have to pay rent. I do have to pay my condo fees, because I'll have to pay that anyway. But that's just a better economic environment, I think, to sort of look at. Renting is just not tax efficient as well due to the principal residence exemption, unless you have a cottage as a main home. So for us, we're exactly in this last case where our cottage is really our main home. We have a pied-à-terre in town that we'll use while I'm working here or if you need a city fix, you know, to go to a play or go to a movie or do anything like that. This is our house in Mexico after we built it, which still isn't very pretty, but it's very cheap. And it's right on the ocean, so it's nice. So, Trump, so uh, the Trump dynasty, I'm coming to the end here, so this is good, good timing. I call it that again, it's the duck dynasty thing. 14 million votes in a primary does not a president make. If he continues in his rhetoric, he will lose. If he can keep his mouth shut and his ego curbed, he just might win. And I decided this one time when he was at a rally in Butte, Montana, and Hillary was giving a speech in New York, and in New York City, Hillary had 300 people attend, and he had 14,000 people attend. And I just said, wow, you know, how do you, that's a lot, you know, like, what do you do with that? So Trump winning is good for the USA in business, and I've heard this a number of times from people, because nothing will get done. And that's great for business, because they're not going to screw anything up. It's only when they do stuff that they screw stuff up, whether Obamacare is a problem or not. So see the Obama, <laughs> the impact on the economy. Since Obama took control of the country, which happened, like timing is everything, right? 2008 or so, right? Comes in at the all-time low. Stock market's gone up like this, and he's going, yippee yay okay, look at what I did. Well, he did nothing. It did it all by itself without him having any impact whatsoever. So that's good. If Republicans get into the House and Senate in control, it will still be slow going for him because he's polarized so many people in the US. You've probably all heard this. He does not play well with others. And even though the disaffected middle, middle class, they're the ones that elected him, but PS, they elected Trudeau in Canada. So although in the US they have a few more bubbas than we have in Canada. So essentially that's like the big difference between the two is our middle class is a little better educated than the bubbas of Alabama and wherever else. Trade wars may occur if Donald has his way, which is definitely not good unless he just picks on Mexico. And don't believe for a minute that he'll leave us alone. He's said that a couple times, but you go back to other speeches and he says he wants to, what was the one I saw? He just wants to take over Canada basically, was the, was the one speech that he gave. And he says, well, they may as well just join us. You know, we're perfect, we're great, so they could do that. Or I'm perfect, I'm great. Can you imagine that being, can you imagine? Like, this is just, this is just amazing to me. Yeah, he, he did very, very expensive teeth too, I think. So be flexible in your investments, consider conservative investments, and watch out for crashes. Take advantage of silly crashes. I'm a market timer, investment brokers hate me. Because I always like to say, gee, the market just went down 500 points. Why wouldn't I buy? You know, it, it, and it just makes sense to me all the time because most of these events are short-term events that make no sense. Like Greece, what an impact on Canada could Greece have? Like very little or none. What impact on the US? None, it just doesn't matter. Now, if the Euro fails, 
I think the U.S. wins in the long run and the U.S. dollar will go up more of a flight to safety because everybody in Europe is going to say the euro's gone. If the pound sterling stands by itself, nobody's going to want to keep pounds. Their, their pound has already gone down significantly. So the U.S. dollar, even with that guy, where is he here? here. This guy, okay, is going to go up because everybody's looking for a safe haven. It's really hard to think that this is a safe haven, but I give up on that part. Remember, the Eurozone has a larger GDP than the United States and larger than China as well. Not larger than both combined, but a bigger GDP than the US. So it's a big economy about to get fractured because if England leaves, and I say England because Ireland and Wales have said that they're going to stay. So it's going to be a bit of a mess. If England leaves, Spain's going to start looking at it. Italy's going to start looking at it. A lot of the other countries are going to start looking at being able to go back and manipulate their currency to be able to make their environment more palatable. The euro was an awful idea when it started, except for Germany. Germany's the big winner in the euro. And they're the big economic boom there too. So if it looks like he will win, stay tuned for other potential changes to the US and the world environment. The, uh, the rest of the world thinks our American neighbors have gone crazy, but the worldwide phenomena is that the middle class wants their money back. So the people in Canada and the US, the people that worked at the Ford Motor Plant in St. Thomas and in Oakville used to make $120,000 a year working on the line. Those jobs are all gone and those people are mad. And the same thing has happened in the US. Detroit has been totally hollowed out. They're all gone. The jobs have all moved to North Carolina where it's $18 per hour, not $38 per hour. So that disaffection of the middle class is happening everywhere in the world right now. And the reality is that when you look at this, the world's 0.01%, so not the one percenters, you fall into the one percenters. Wheeze falls into the one percenter because it's not hard to fall into the one percent, highest one percent of income or net worth. The 0 0.01 is like the billionaires, okay? They now control as much in the U.S. as the lower 90% of the American population. So their net worth of the 0.01% of the U.S. is equal to 90% net worth, everybody down from 90%. So you wonder why they're mad. Like it's, they want the better things, they want to be able to get them, and they think Donald Trump's gonna give it to them. Make America great. These guys look much more like politicians to me, even Trudeau in this particular case, than does Mr. Trump. So, and actually Obama, I'm starting to like Obama and I haven't liked him in a long time. <laughs> He's starting to look pretty good compared to Clinton and everybody else. Okay, that's it. Bang on time. <laughs>